what lessons you learn in prison and why so many people who've been in prison have a hard time to adjust. Sometimes it's just healthy communication and talking to people and understanding that like, even if you hit a roadblock in business, in life, in relationships, you know, it's always it's always just communication. But do, do you see what's happening right now with the PPP loans? <sighs> I made a mistake when I was younger. I paid for that mistake. I got out, I started a business. Dave, um, how often do you hear from people around you that you are a crazy person? You know, maybe once or twice. <laughs> I might have heard that before. You've always been this way. You are like, all over. just being with you in the same room, your energy outpaces everybody in almost any space. I pre so I've, I've been told before that I, that I take a lot of air out of the room. And at first I thought that was like a negative thing. But for me, it's like, you know, if I had an off switch, I probably wouldn't know how to use it or it would be broken. I just, you know, with if, if I'm with my family, if I'm with, with you guys here, if I'm with, to me, like transparency is key. And I just, you know, I just try to be myself all the time. And I guess for, you know, for the situations I went through in life, Dimitri, like I was, I was in prison from when I was 21 to 25. So it's my next question. <laughs> so let's talk about it. Yeah. Today you're running two businesses. You've been in prison. How long have you been in prison? Uh, it was just short of four years. Four years. Yeah, four years. What for? Uh, so in a, in a past life, I had a bunch of family from Humboldt, California. Um, we brought, you know, hundred, hundreds of pounds of marijuana here since I was, you know, past statute of limitations now, so I can talk about this stuff. Like, And, and today you would not even get in trouble for it. No, that, well, that's, that's what's fascinating. I mean, for me, it was like, you look at business and risk adversity and, um, I, dude, I was counting a million dollars in a hotel room when I was 17. Like that was just normality. You know, we all go down our paths in lives. And for me, that was normal. And so when I understood, I guess, first to your question, what do I get in trouble for? Um, some people broke into a house, stole some money from me. I went back to their house, kicked the door in, ended up hurting someone. Uh, I got stabbed four times in that house. And uh, so, I mean, I'm knife proof. That was one one lesson from there. <laughs> um but yeah, I, I, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, two first degree burglaries, uh, first degree aggravated robbery and a second degree assault. And they basically told me um, I can take uh, one felony, take eight years. I can take four felonies, take four years, or I can tell who the other people I was in the house with six months. Or it was, uh, it was a year and a day in the workhouse, no felonies. Me and Mr. Tough Guy back then, I said, run the four years. Let's, let's do it. And uh, yeah, looking back, I mean, it's just, I, like, I reflect on this a lot now. As a parent, we have, we have our fourth child on the way now. We just found out a couple, like two weeks ago. Wow, um, thank you, thank you. Um, I look back to how I was thinking in my life then, and like I can't relate to I didn't have anything. I, would, like, I had no businesses, I had no family, I had no, like, nothing to make me you know, reflect on, on, on loss, on risk, and coming from a very like, risk-adverse background. Um, I just kind of was the epitome of everything I, I wanted to be. And that kind of led me down that. Over the years, I hired a few guys who've been in jail, mm -hmm. but they seem to always go back to that life. And how, yeah. like w what lessons you learn in prison and why so many people who've been in prison have a hard time to adjust to everyday life? I think because it's easier. It's easier to live that type of lifestyle. I know how to play it here, where to be and what rules to follow. I got a bed. You, well, you just, you hear about the guys, right? I see like your face scrunch up when you like, think about this though. You hear about the guys going through like a drug treatment type of thing, right? They say sick and tired of being sick and tired. Yeah. And so for me, when I, when I got out, it was like, I went right back to the same thing for about a year, you know, messing around, like what? And I just saw that nothing was gonna change. And so like, I always understood, like I had a work ethic, I could get in and I could, I was always able to like, whether it was like, work a deal or, or be able to like provide for myself. I never had that issue, but to do that in a way that wouldn't get you in a situation where you were, you know, getting what, what's our most valuable asset. I talk to business owners about this all the time. Now it's our minutes, it's our time. And if you're going to risk something that can take your time away from you, that's the biggest risk in the world. Like risk my money. I've lost it before I've made it back. Like that's not that scary to me, but when you, when you equate, having things, having people, businesses, family that you're responsible for. I think for me, it was being able to take that time more seriously because, you know, when you're, when you're a man growing up, 21 to 25, some pretty developmental years. And to your first question, you know, the, 
the craziness, the energy, that that type of stuff. The self-awareness is key. You know, if you can't be, if you can't identify with that guy you wake up and talk to in the mirror every morning and understand what you're good at, what you're bad at, what you bring to the table, I've always understood, you know, the way that I am, but it's also my responsibility in, in business, in relationships to be accountable for that. How did it affect you later in business? Because people tend to not do business with criminals. Yeah. Be careful. Like, I mean, uh, have you tried to get a full-time job somewhere maybe? Or you I've had two jobs in my life. Really? So you're just entrepreneurially and in business, it does not matter as much, I guess. So I have, I have a story actually. So I applied for my, my cleaning company that we've talked about that I have here in the Twin Cities. I applied for the EIDL loan uh, back, you know, it was about a year ago now. Um, they approved me like 480,000. And uh, three days later, they come back, they say, oh, never mind. You're not an upstanding citizen. Uh, you, you can't have this money. This is, you know, 11 years since I've gotten in trouble. I employ 30 something people. I got a couple businesses and Dimitri had crushed me. It was like, after all this stuff, I still can't, you know, I still have to fight this. If we ever try to get funding, we ever try to get housing, you ever, you always got to explain this stuff. And so I sat down and I wrote a letter to the, the SBA and I said, Hey, you know, this is a, a disaster relief loan. Um, I made a mistake when I was younger. I paid for that mistake. I got out. I started a business. We run the business. The business is now affected by something going on in the world. And now you tell me that I'm not a good upstanding. This is like, this is the equivalent if I was in Katrina on the roof with my family and they say, nope, fell in, bad credit score. They fly over you. They don't pick you up. I said, this isn't, this isn't fair. So uh, I, I put some notes. I write the letter. I get a call three days later from this wonderful lady at the SBA. She said, this David Carroll? I was like, yeah. She's like, this, my name's Mary. I work at the, I've worked at the SBA 32 years. I want you to know. That is the most thoughtful, well put together, well thought out letter I've ever written. Your loan will be expedited. It'll be funded in the next two days. And it's like this, you know, we get down on ourselves. Everyone's like made mistakes, whether all the things you, you've not gotten caught for, or the things you have to pay for, the, the decisions you made that have repercussions. <sighs> Sometimes it's just healthy communication and talking to people and understanding that like, even if you hit a roadblock in business, in life, in relationships, you know, It's always, it's always just communication. Give someone your minutes, explain your side of the story. And so for me, it was like. So all you did is just wrote the letter and because of that letter, so it wasn't like guidelines. I mean, there was a decision maker there. She get to decide and you help her just, you know, it's a crazy story. Like, and I hear those all the time. I just watched a really big documentary about um, big entrepreneur from Ukraine. He was trying to come to U.S. to get in this market. They were doing some custom boards, like amazing stuff. But they were uh, uh, trying to come here for the expo to show their product, and they could not get visa for years. And he was sitting on the interview with a U.S. officer who approving visas and stuff. And uh, for like I don't know how many times they tried to come. Like they were doing amazing, like yeah. millions of dollars in sales. Yeah. And he sits in front of him, but they build this amazing brand. And uh, officer asked him like, "What is it that you do?" He told him what he does, and he's like, "You know what? I actually have used you. Like I've used the company as a as a gift. Like I bought gifts from you for my friends and family." Like, uh, like I know your company. <laughs> you right, it was like right. approved. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you open up, you share your story. Like it happened to me many times, and doors magically open. And that's the thing. It's it's being it's being honest. It's being transparent. You know, I never like being the guy that leads with, "I'm a felon entrepreneur, and you can make it." And da da da. I'm good at this because no, it's not that. I think for me, it's. It's not something you put in a business card like veteran owned. Like, no, no, no. And, felon and, owned. And, and, yeah, felon owned, <laughs> trust me. It's like it's it's not that good leader. And I see I see guys and influencers, and everyone's got their path, right? And I appreciate it. And I know some very successful guys that get on stage, and that's the first thing they talk about. I was in prison and I can make it and I can do it. My thing is more like there's a level of authenticity when you can be honest with someone, but I don't think you need to, you know, and again, to each their own, but for me. I'm never the guy that leads right away. But do, do you see what's happening right now with the PPP loans? Like, do you see business, business owners going to jail? <laughs> no, they're going just for me. And for, for committing fraud? It's, all, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me when you see people, you know. Who every, you would never thought of. Ever, but they've. 
They trick the system and they they the, there's a level of like okay I'm not gonna sit here and say like I respect the criminal by any means, yeah. but it's self awareness. If you're not the guy who doesn't know how to get in trouble and take responsibility and whatever, and you've never really broken the rule, but you want to take something like the government's money and start messing with like that's probably not the best idea to go you know, explore a different walk of life of potentially getting in trouble with Uncle Sam's money. I wouldn't. And I, I, I would even tell, uh, add to it, like the biggest case, if you study Ponzi schemes and like really big, I mean, American the biggest ones in and American Greece, oh, typical oh. stories, it's your, you know, aunt accountant who will embarrass every like time. Millions, <laughs> every it, time. It'll, it'll be someone you would never have. <laughs> the little guy started. in the corner with the glasses that you would never, yeah. yeah. And he's what, was the, what was the biggest scam of all times that, um, on the Wall Street, uh, the biggest one, fifty billion dollars. What was the name? He has two sons. Talk about Bernie. Uh, he just died. Madoff. Madoff. Yeah, he just passed away. I think, like, really? in the past week or two. I think uh, I my know. mom sent me a text, something about he died in prison. Think about him. People would never thought of. I mean, never. our government politicians. Those are the biggest. He was. He was the decision maker. He was the. He was the authority. And again, it just goes to show, like, you know, I was talking. I was talking to Adam Sand about this last week, actually. At the end of any decision, it's just some people in the room. Like there's always, there's always some people that came up with how this is going to work or how this is going to, on the smallest level and on the biggest level. And when you, when you come to that reality and that understanding that like, you know, not only is anything possible, but there's someone at the end, it, it could be the people in the office with the president. It could be something as small as the back door of McDonald's and who's going to get hired or whatever. There's a couple people having communication and a conversation of where decisions come from. And when you understand the relativity of that in life and business, it kind of like makes things a little bit easier. Well, th that's what's happening right now with the Excel roofing, you know, 20, 30 million dollar company folded, closed five offices. And uh, I have so many people reached out and he's like, Dimitri, we work for this company. We thought we we're doing everything well. Someone at the top, mismanagement, two PPP loans, took uh, <laughs> advantage of all the deposits, yep. stuff, lost their license, could not do it. You read the story, like big companies too, yeah. 20, 30 million dollar company. That's not. <laughs> that's a lot of <laughs> yeah. people involved. Yeah. But people don't know what's happening at the top. Yep. And no clue, right? Yeah. It's, it's some people in a room with a closed door, and yeah. it's this. Yeah. Exactly right. Fascinating stuff. Cool. Absolutely. Absolutely.